All right, John, you can begin. Talk about what, how you come up with the, with the theme for the show. Uh Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. I saw all these work. I mean, I get invited to go to uh, MFA studios. I was asked to uh, judge a jury of a show on Miami University in Ohio. And I've seen, I saw a lot of work in the last, say, four years of different young artists. And then when you asked me to do a show, slowly, I... Uh, I began to piece together the show based on what the artists were doing. So basically the show comes out of the artists. So I saw Samuel Alexander Forrest. I saw work by, you know, Megan Murray. I saw, and I, they don't look obviously connected. I mean, they're not stylistically connected, but what I felt connected them was subject matter. And then I thought, how interesting that all these artists are picking subjects that are historically, they have a long history, portraiture, still life, landscape. And then I also thought the whole thing about art, I moved to New York in 1975, and then when, quote, painting was dead, uh, I didn't believe it, but somehow people kept telling me it was. Then in uh, 78, I began writing about art for art in America. And the whole story then was that there was a narrative of modernism that was about progress. It seems to me in the 1980s and 90s that narrative finally broke down and that any art, any artist could do anything and I was interested that these artists decided to do something like still life. Like, how do you make a still life new? How do you make a portrait new? How do you make a landscape new? Or how do you get us to see the world that we all see, but we don't see the same way? And I felt like all of these artists made something mysterious, interesting, and it caught my attention. I mean, it just stayed in my mind. It was easy to put the show together because I, I literally had memorized all the works, mm -hmm. right? So it was not like I had to think, oh, who should I put in the show? It was like, oh, look at all these images in my head that seem to fit together. And that's how I put the show together. And then that's when I wrote the little essay for you. So... And I love all the paintings in the show. It's just too bad I'm not a collector. Otherwise, I'd buy them all. But I'm not a collector. I'm just the guy who writes about art. So, I mean, I think there... And I also love how serious everybody is, but has don't take themselves too seriously in a way. I mean, there was one point in the 80s where there were these artists who would go unnamed who we took themselves a bit too seriously and it became kind of ponderous to me and heavy-handed i like the kind of delicacy of the hand paint handling and all of the artists here i like the kind of way they approach this subject matter then they're, they're kind of fearless they're painting they're working in an area that many people worked in before them and they're not afraid to do something and see if they can make it fresh you know they're not nostalgic for the past one of the things about painting in the 80s with certain painters was they had a kind of nostalgia for abstract expressionism nostalgia for the heroic you know, and that kind of nostalgia was like, why do you want to look back, right? If you're nostalgic for a moment earlier in society, art-wise, are you also nostalgic for that social social relationships of that moment? Well, I'm not nostalgic for the 50s. I don't care. I'm not nostalgic. I love paintings from the 50s, but I'm not nostalgic. I don't want to go back to the 50s and live in that world. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's bad enough now, but the 50s, I think, was worse. Yeah. You know, just basically, all these artists just really grabbed me. I mean, it's that simple. It's really like a gut reaction. You look at art, and it either grabs you or it doesn't. You can recognize something is good, but it might not emotionally grab you. And I have to say, all the art in this show and all the artists and sh 
and the show did work that just really grabbed me. So I thought, oh, I have an opportunity to put them together in an exhibition. How wonderful, right? I want that. I want to have done that. I want to have shown these artists together. I'm glad that this would be the first time they were all together, and I take full responsibility for having stuck them in the same room. Uh, I don't really know these people well. Some of them have only been in their studios for an hour and a half, so I don't really know them as people, but I really love their work. And I think Abigail I've not even ever met before, but I saw her work in uh, Ohio. I was completely knocked out by it. And then, um, then I saw it again at Stephen Harvey and I was knocked out again. You know, sometimes you get knocked out by someone's work and then you look at it a month later or two months later and you go, uh, why was I knocked out by that? But that was not the case with Abigail, was not the case with Samuel Alexander Forrest, was not the case with any of these people. You know, it was just like I stayed in my mind um, and I think that's the most important thing. Go through, go through each, um, can you talk to us? Go, about, about each about work? Each, yes, each artist. Oh my God. Wait, All right, what, let's what start with Abigail uh -huh. Dudley. Uh -huh. So the first piece of hers that I really liked was this uh, um, Siemens electrical box on a telephone pole. Uh, which is not, I don't think it's in this show, but that's the first piece of hers that I kept going back to in this exhibition that I organized uh, in Ohio. And then I saw other works of hers at the convention center and uh, the South Portrait I didn't see uh, actually till now, and I'm still only seeing an image, but I remember seeing a self-portrait by Abigail and saying to Stephen Harvey, you have to give me a self-portrait for the show. It's a terrific painting. I mean, you know, sometimes art, art writers just don't know what to say. That's actually a really good moment, mm -hmm. right? They're kind of dumbfounded. I mean, I, you know, you can, art, art writers can make anything look good, right? That's their job. So when you're dumbfounded, it means it's so good you don't know how to make it look good because it already does look good. So that's that. Then there's Calvin Kim's strange still life. What's that object on the table, right? Yeah. So it's like he's reinvented still life to some degree, and it's not overtly surrealist. But, you know, you could – and surreal is such a bad word. It's overused. Um, but it's, it's mysterious, that painting, and I liked it the minute it, I saw it. So there's that painting. Um, then there's the beautiful uh, sewer grating by Laura Pedrick that I think is great. Yeah, yeah I mean, look at that painting. Look at all the attention paid to the metal grating, right? The thing that we walk over every day, never look at, a word that we're going to drop our keys down or lose something in. And, the, you know, and it's a grid. It's a kind of grid. So it's a kind of response to modernism, but it takes modernism and turns it upside down. Hi, modernism is this high thing, and I'm going to show you a sewer grading. And I'm going to give it as much attention as Bryce Martin gives to brown and blue and red. Right? So that's a beautiful tender, sympathetic, there's no irony. It's like if every, you know, if God is in the details, as has been said, then the details are the most common things we don't look at, right? So there is a kind of almost, I would say, a kind of spiritual side to that painting. Um, even though I didn't, I didn't think that the minute I saw it, I, but it came to me later thinking about the painting that you can make a case that it's a spiritual painting right mm -hmm. it's also a painting about the sphere of your life emptying away right there's the sewer where does your life go what happens to your life you wake up you know i'm 73 i wake up and go oh crap what have i done right <laughs> So, I mean, that painting kind of reminds me of that. Like, maybe I didn't spend my 
life doing everything I wanted to do. So when do I start to do it, right? So there's a lot to think about in a very kind of straightforward painting. And then these two strange paintings by Megan Murray. Uh, yes. <laughs> Megan is up with that. Wait, wait. Is that you? Yeah. Well, I love the painting on the left. Those two boys. I'm glad I didn't know them when I was a child. But uh, And this whole thing about what do boys in America, how do we raise them? to become in this notion that they can still be heroes. What does it mean? What is it to raise a child to be a hero? Now I'm gonna tell this little digressive story. Uh, I was in China for two weeks and I met a woman that I was a, is a scholar and she has a boy who's I guess eight and I was talking with her and she said that in China, all they do is teach you to be obedient. And that it's somehow for young women or girls, this seems to be okay. But boys who are disobedient suffer for this. And, they, and it kind of screws them up for life. And I just thought about obedience, disobedience, heroic, all those things we haven't figured out as human instinct impulses how to deal with it what how to channel it and i just think these the painting on the left kind of brings that up that blue kind of reminds you that it this is a moment from the past but in a way it's not a moment from the past, right and then the figure on the right with this uh, strange space outfit with this rocket cone I mean, I remember 1963 when I was 13, before any of you were born. <laughs> you know, there's a guy in space and blah, 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 John Glenn, and all this kind of weird cheering. And I have to say, I wasn't cheering. I wasn't upset about it. I just didn't feel like this kind of national unity, right? And we certainly haven't had none of that since. Um, anyway, I love the color in the in that kind of sunset color in the painting on the right. Uh, I love I love the just the this totally straightforward like they could be photos they could be based on something from a family album, but made into a painting and colored the way they are, they really kind of make you think about that moment and how it led to this moment. But it also just as a painting is beautiful. I mean, beyond anything else, you know, great paintings, if they have a message or not, I don't think these do. They're just beautiful. You want to look at them. You want Lizzie? Uh, oh, yeah, these are terrific paintings by Lizzie. Um, Lizzie. Lizzie, say hello. Hi, Lizzie. <laughs> I haven't seen Lizzie since about, since I was 20. So some time ago. Anyway, I just, uh, I got knocked out by your paintings when I went to um, uh, Columbia and saw them. And she was doing these things with transparency, like windows. And she was doing all these kind of odd angles. She had a painting based on like a disco ball and all, reflection and all the kind of glass, which I thought was an insane thing to try and do, but a kind of insanity I respect. And then when I saw the painting on the left, I, well, partly I was just reminded of being in Germany, all right? I mean, it's a kind of, it's, but also the notion that you can see the door, what's on the door, through the door, what's outside, where are you, you know, you're in the store, you're about to leave, what kind of store is it? It seems like one of those classic stores that has a lot of stuff that no other store wants to sell. So it ends up in this store, right? There's a kind of, a, a, what do they call them? Dollar stores all now kind of spread out all over the place. And you feel like in the dollar store, you can find something you want, but do you really need it? And, and, I, and, and also in a funny, interesting way, it reminds me, I don't know if any of you are like 
this, but when I go in a supermarket, I tend to freak out because I don't want to know that there's 200 kinds of cereal available. <laughs> I don't think that that's really that important to have that many kinds of oats available and this and that. And, and so you feel like, particularly in a society that's kind of dedicated to production of waste, and the production of, and the idea that if we all need to consume a certain goods or have certain things, there's something deeply touching about the two gloves that don't match, that are different colors hanging there, and that you don't really want. What occasion would prompt any one of us to buy those gloves, except maybe Halloween, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm reading a lot into it, but it, 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 her paintings stir up all sorts of odd associations, which I like. And I think that's one of the things, you know, one of the things that happened with art is it stopped making associations out of, out of the ordinary. It made associations of the heroic, the grand traditions, but out of the ordinary and the basic it kind of ignored. And I think that's one of the things I love about this painting. And the one next to it is such an odd, interesting view. Like, why would you stop and stare straight up in a store? But of course you would, because look what's up there. And why is it up there? And what is this? So that, I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those stores where you feel like they want to take advantage of every space in the store. I don't know if any of you have ever been in, like, South Korea, where there's a, these weird stores in the underground tunnels going to this to a major department store, and there's all these stalls and stuff. And uh, I've been shopping there, you know, and it reminded me of that and of different kind of um, outdoor store stall stores. I mean, I don't think it is that, but I think that's what really struck me about this painting and also just the perspective you're looking straight up there's that thing in the center and then there's all these planes angled planes of different colors and it's a kind of uh, cacophonous melody which is like living in New York City or any urban center there's a cacophonous melody to it that you either like or you don't like you know so there's that there's hi Oh, I yeah. love his painting. I love everybody's painting in this show. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally promiscuous. I love everybody's painting. I'm not higher hierarchical. Yeah. So you want to uh, talk about me? Uh, this is an early book by Kevin, or you want to talk about the Tondo? I want to talk about the self-portrait oval. You know, I have a theory about this painting. I've never talked to Kevin about it, but I did write about it. That the notion that your your distortion if you think of Egon Sheila and if you think of various artists who distorted the body, they were talking about a kind of internal pain, right? This painting takes the kind of a circular surface, a kind of uh, convex uh, surface and it shows the body being distorted so then it's really the outer reality is distorted the body and then if you think about the implications just of that practical observation one can speculate on lots of different things uh, and also just how do we locate ourselves in this world right we live in I mean where am I right now? I'm sitting in a library in Terre Haute, Indiana, talking to people in Boston. You know, it's like, where am I, right? Where, where, where do I exist? And, and that, that, I think, is really interesting. And he, he raises all those issues in the kind of most straightforward and yet most subtle way. And I just think it's, I mean, like all the works in the show that are paintings, are, it's beautifully painted. I mean, you know, the no, and, and you know, there's this notion that craft is like a bad thing, but actually, one of the things about all the artists in the show is you feel like 
the craft is completely necessary to the work itself. It's not extraneous to the work. It's necessary to the work itself. I can point to lots of works where I feel the craft is really wonderful, but it's extraneous to the work. And here I feel the craft is totally merged with the meaning, right? Okay. And, and I think one of the things that struck me when I saw Samuel Alexander Forrest's work was how simple and straightforward and mysterious it was that here he is making these things a laundry basket out of paper with a folded shirt inside. And suddenly this object seems very strange and mysterious. And yet the, at the same time, just to go back to the craft is absolutely necessary to make it the way it is, right? And then that merging of craft and vision and subject matter that's what makes the show what makes these artists so interesting to me that there is this moment now where you can put all that together and you come up with something that seems to me very original so all right too bad i'm not the curator at loma <laughs> I think we've covered all seven, so I, th I think they have questions for you. No, no, no? They have questions. Well, I, I, was, I would love to have you point that camera at that pipe included with that painting. Perfect. Nonetheless, because it's a very interesting dialogue. Okay, so the placement of the, um, the sewer next to the pipe. Oh, uh, that's just what happens. <laughs> 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 it's just what happens, is it? <laughs> I mean, in a way, it, it reminds us that, you know, one of the things about buildings is they cover up their interior uh, intestines, so to speak, so that you don't know all the stuff is going on. So the fact that the thing is next to the kind of intestinal pipe, who knows what's passing through it, right? Uh, it's a kind of good reminder to kind of let's look at the circumstances we live in and what is it and how does it operate and is it really a, a good way it operates or not you know I mean in China I was I, in China I took three trains and they were all bullet trains and I managed to travel you know 500 miles in four hours right you get on an Amtrak train and it's like you're in a wheelchair going downhill and you're holding on for dear life and people don't, you know, don't respect you, don't, it's horrible, right? <laughs> oh, oh, so Matt has a question. Hi. Um, so I, I was thinking about the remark you made about how, um, I guess in the 80s there was a, um, movement to kind of resist the idea of, of art um, being, I, I might have remembered this wrong, but whether, like, whether, whether modernism was, had to be a reflection of progress or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, do you, believe, do, you be, do you believe that art is meant to be a trajectory of progress? Do you believe that, or do you believe that art is a fluid um, kind of equilibrium between progress and the or, or is it something completely different where there's no binary at all? Um, I, don't, I don't believe in art is progress. Okay, so I went into the case in the Dordogne when I was, um, many years ago. And uh, when I was down in the cave, a woman, the guide, had a little pencil red light. And she showed a horse. And she said, 26 strokes, no hesitation. And that's all she had to say. And then you thought, how far have we progressed from that, <laughs> right? Here's this culture, the society we know almost nothing about. We don't know why they made these things, but there are these drawings on the caves that really deal with the contour, rough surface of the rock to suggest movement, to suggest the body of the horse, 26 marks, no erasing, I don't know, was Picasso better than that? I don't think so. 
And uh, I think he knew it too. And I think in a way the notion of progress is a kind of, it's a social construction. You know, it's capitalism wants to believe in progress and socialism wants to believe in progress. But that doesn't have anything to do, I think, with art. That has to do with some narrative that I um, was not interested in. So in the, in the 80s, it kind of begins to fall apart. Um, and uh, in a way, I think it hasn't fallen apart enough. And then, of course, if it falls apart, you, you know, someone's going to say, but there's no standard, right? How do we know what's really good and what's not good? And then we all become somewhat confused, right? Well, what's wrong with accepting that confusion to some degree and thinking, all right, let's see what I think, why I think A is good and not B. Can I, can I really think this through? Can I really begin to see what's in front of me? I think we have yet to really figure out how to see what's in front of us. I think okay. artists can see what's in front of them. Look at all the art in the show. But I think writers, we still are trying to figure out how to see what's in front of us and how to write about it clearly and how to make an argument for it and how to say why we think it's important. And I think that's a great, great challenge. You know, so, I mean, that's why I keep still writing about art. I haven't gotten bored yet. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, um, there's three, I would say like three types of 3D work in the show. Right. And to me, they all have, they all reference the 2D work that either is by the same artist or um, have play with like flatness and echo or. Um, well, there's flatness there's, and there's transparency. There's some modeling. There's reflection, right? There's all these different ways of seeing. Um, but I think you're smart about this than me, Lizzie. Maybe you should have written this essay. <laughs> there's just there's there's this piece that's on the on a fence, but it's a painting on a 3D object, right? Which it's in, that's interesting. And then Calvin's ceramic piece, ceramic piece is referencing his painting. Yes, is a is in relation to this painting or other work of his, and there's interior well i think paintings become more elastic about what it can do it doesn't always have to be on a flat surface right yeah. and it can suggest different kinds of surfaces like the convex surface that kevin refers to or this fence and also if you think about it just i mean this just popped in my head so is we see paint everywhere right we see it on walls we see it here and there and yet, hot, hot, and a painting doesn't only have to be one way, right? I mean, just yeah. another thing, Liz, as a poet, you kind of taught at a certain point what a poem is, but the longer I've written, the less I know what a poem is. The less I can tell, I mean, I write poems, but I, I can't say, oh, poems are this or poems are that. And I think in a way, art is really in the state of we don't actually know what it is, right? And, and that artists can do, I mean, in some way you could say all these artists are conservative to the extent that they're working in a tra somewhat traditional way, you know, a, a medium on a surface or ceramics or paint on wood, right? But traditional as they are there's something fresh about their work and if we can't see that we have a problem and what i saw in this work was this there was a freshness to it they didn't feel burdened by history in the way that some people are you know uh, and i feel like that freshness is actually one of the best things about what's going on in art now Right, it's like we've finally cut ourselves loose from all these narratives that we we're supposed to pay attention to and work within, 
And so I think now is really, you know, Tom Niskowski said it's the golden moment for painting, right? I believe him. I think he was right. I think it's a golden moment, and I think the art world is not aware of it. You know, it's really a goal. I mean, and 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 they, the art world wants to pay attention to auction records, right? It makes it makes artists into like a horse race. Yeah. There's David. Hockney is beating Georgia O'Keeffe <laughs> coming into the final turn. You know, uh, oh, that's boring. It's the art that she's supposed to be looking at and thinking about. I get, get off my high horse. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you see uh, uh, the seven artists that you have selected? They, they are. Uh, female identified people and uh, three minorities I, <laughs> okay. I didn't think about that really uh, I, when I put yeah. it together I, I looked at the group and I was really happy how diverse the group was but I feel like it was not my intention to put together a diverse group but when the group turned out to be diverse so i was very happy about that i think they're kind of there's notions of diversity that kind of make people they force artists to fit into something and i don't think that's healthy it seems to me all these artists their di the, the, the diversity of their work the diversity of their identity it seems to me all there in the work it's not overt it's not overly overstated. I think the notion of how you identify yourself in your work gets kind of emphasized by the art world because they want to make it easy for themselves. And I'm not interested in that. I mean, so when I finished putting together the show and I looked at what I did, I have to say I was pretty happy with myself. You know, I hate to like pat myself on the back over and over, but it's really only because of the artist. Mm -hmm. It's not because the a curator is only as good as the artist. The curator is never better than the artist. Okay, so I feel like, wow, look at these artists. I feel pretty good about this. You know, it's pretty simple. You know, I'm really, I mean, I'm really happy that I did it. Well, we we all want to thank you, John. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. No, this, this, I'm happy you invited me, my son, and I'm really happy that I got to put these seven artists together, and I hope they all get along with each other. So, <laughs> we do. You never know, right? It could be seven people, and you're stuck in an elevator, and only two of you will emerge. So. Uh, I didn't, no, we worry didn't. about that though. We but I think I mean I really, I, I, looking at the show. I mean I'm gonna come to Boston tomorrow to see the show, but uh, I, I know I'm gonna really love it. Oh. And I'm sorry I'm not a collector, but I am happy that I'm a curator and art writer. Okay, all right. We are too. We are too. Well, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.